I was praying about what to share this week, and um, the word that came to me is power encounter. I'm like, didn't I just preach on that not too long ago? Actually, I did last year. And, um, but I felt like God wanted us to be reminded of this, and this isn't going to be identical to what I preached before, but some of it might sound similar. So I want to share with you um, what God has laid on my heart. Let me ask this question. What will change our lives and our world? Is it more knowledge and truth that will transform people's lives? Perhaps partially. After all, truth can set people free if we live it, right? Is it better movies or, uh, that inspire us or inspiration from speakers or people? Perhaps we, we can get motivation from some of those things. Perhaps they can be a catalyst for change. But what will change our lives in our world? Is it better families? If we would just strengthen the family life? Is it better preachers? Perhaps these things will help us in our society. But will they change our lives in our world? Is it more action on the things that are good and less sinful actions going on in the world? Uh, that should help, shouldn't it? But if you could pick one thing that will change lives, change the world, and motivate people to radically transform their lives, what would it be? What would that be? Think about that for a second. If you could pick one thing that will change lives, change the world, and motivate people to radically transform their lives, what would it be? What would change your life? What would motivate you? What would change the trajectory of where you are to where God wants you to be? I think the disciples were in the same boat after Jesus had risen from the dead and left the world. What could change them forever? What was the one thing that would change them and change the world that they lived in? I submit to you today that the one thing I believe that can best change you is the same thing that changed the early disciples and changed the early church. It is a power encounter with God and His Holy Spirit. A vision, a dream, a miracle, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. More of the things of God permeating our life will change us. How many of you believe that when God steps down in, in a supernatural way and you experience that, it does something to you? It does. And often it begins with an experience that propels you into a new realm of excitement or possibility or spiritual dynamics that you have never or rarely experienced. Your life would never be the same again. That's why I sang that song today. When God touches your life, you can sing a song like, I will never be the same again. I can never return I've closed the door, I will walk the path, I'll run the race, and I will never be the same again. You see, you cannot sing that from the heart unless you've had a change. And if you have experienced that, that song is more than just words. It is a life lesson. It is a, a heart's cry to God says, I will never be the same because you have done something in my life. And I am changed. You see, our world needs better political leaders for sure. And it needs common sense sometimes. And it needs corruption to be exposed. But for the kingdom of light and of God to invade this world and the lives of so many people, we desperately need power encounters with God. The living God to show up. You see, he didn't make the world and walk away and say, there, it's yours. Take care of it. He wants to be intimately involved with us. 1 Corinthians 4.20 actually tells it this way. If you want a Bible scripture that goes along with what I'm saying. It says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. When I was thinking about this, one of my favorite movies I was thinking about a line, and we're going to show it in just a second. The main character, George Bailey, in It's a Wonderful Life, is walking the neighbor girl Mary home from a dance. Some of you remember that? 
And that story, they'd just fallen in the water because the pool had opened up. And they're singing as they come home, enjoying each other's company. And then this happens. Let's watch this short little clip from it. And the moonbeams that shoot out of your fingers and your toes and the ends of your hair. Am I talking too much? Yes. Why don't you kiss her instead of talking to her to death? How was I? Why don't you kiss her instead of talking at her death? Want me to kiss her, huh? Uh, oh, youth is wasted on the wrong people. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking about that. You know, see, it's not a matter of talk. He's basically saying, do something about it. If you like this girl, why don't you kiss her instead of talking to her death? Oh, youth is wasted on the wrong people, he says. <laughs> You see, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. He could talk to death and nothing would happen. The neighbor thinks he ought to do something. You, can, you can't really talk your way into love. You can't talk your way into the kingdom of God. Something else has to take place. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk or words. It is power. You see, we can be people with the best doctrine in the world. We can believe all the right things about God. We can believe the truth. We can have the slickest and rich, richest and nicest and best church services that you've ever seen. We can wrap God in a nice box and deliver him to people in a nice way. But the thing that will transform their lives and our lives and our world and our situations is this. When we encounter the power of God, it changes us. Have you ever experienced the power of God? Did it change you? It does. So what is a power encounter? Let me talk a little bit about that, some of the things that I think God wants us to hear today. A power encounter is personally encountering the power of God. Pretty simple. And I did quote this last year, but I'm going to quote it again. In his 1971 book, People, Movements in Southern Polynesia, a guy named Alan Tippett notes that in the South Pacific Islands, the early acceptance of the gospel usually occurred when there was a quote-unquote encounter demonstrating that the power of God is greater than that of the local pagan deity. People saw through the supernatural that the power of God was more powerful than their false gods. You see, people are changed when they see the power of God at work. Not just, hey, you guys believe some nice stuff. Power encounters are often associated with things such as healings, deliverances, gifts of the Spirit, miracles, or any other supernatural manifestation of the power of God. It can also include miraculous life changes. To get a better picture, it might be helpful to see some examples. There are plenty in the Bible and even in many people's experience. Let me start with some in the Bible. And I've shared these before, but I think they're worth looking at. Let's start with Jesus. Some biblical examples Jesus manifests power over demons, over sickness, over storms, over food. Now here's a big one, over taxes, <laughs> over religious spirits. In Jesus' ministry, we saw the deaf here. We saw the lame walk. We saw even a man walk on water. Those are power encounters. I'm not talking about ice over a lake. That's walking on water in Montana. Walking on water in Israel and the Sea of Galilee is a little more miraculous. Jesus did miraculous things. There are times when God spoke and it was a miraculous power encounter. You know, if in fact, a couple times in the Bible when he, it showed up in power when God spoke, there was lightning and peals of thunder just from his voice. Now, I don't know about you. If God talked to me that way, that would kind of freak me out. But I'm sure that every person who heard that, it changed them. Or how about other times in the Bible when the power of God came in contact with or touched people? It, ought, it often affected them in strange ways. Here's some examples in the Bible. Moses actually glowed. Jacob limped when he wrestled with God over the night. Priests fell down in the presence of God. 
and even a donkey spoke. <laughs> At Pentecost, tongues of fire rested on people's heads and people spoke in tongues or languages that they had never learned themselves. And Paul himself was knocked to the ground with a power encounter with God on the road to Damascus. You see, it's throughout the scriptures we find examples of power encounters, and you find after those empower encounters, it changed people. There's modern day examples as well. I've seen a lot, I've experienced a lot. I know some of you have. At Bible camp, when I was in these camps that we're trying to take these kids to, I remember it's my we had, I had just graduated. I was with my friend who had just graduated. And before one of the services, they asked people to come forward for prayer. I don't even remember what it was for. And all I remember is my friend was laid out on the floor there. And he was, I know this sounds really weird, but he looked like a fish out of water. Because God was doing something inside of his heart and mind People thought he was having an epileptic seizure. They didn't know what was going on. He told me ex later exactly what was going on, and he said there was a battle going on in his mind between Satan and God, saying, God, I said, I want to use you. And Satan says, you're nothing. You're not going to be anything. And that, ha that encounter changed his life forever. You want to know what happened to my friend? My friend, who was a de deciding on whether he was going to go to a secular college, or Bible college at the time. After this power encounter with God, he ended up going to Bible college. He ended up getting married. He ended up becoming a missionary to China, and now he's planting a church in Boulder, Colorado. Because at that point in his life, he needed a power encounter from God to show him that where he needed to go and what he needed to do. It changed the tra trajectory of his life. God, by the way, God shows up at youth camps in powerful ways, and that's why we get kids to camp. And that's why I encourage anybody who can go to a camp. I don't know what it is about just taking time away from the hustle and bustle of life and just focusing on God, that God shows up. There's been deaf people have been and healed up there. There have been people, obviously, that get changed and saved and transformed. It's just amazing. I have seen people being overwhelmed with the love of God at an altar in a church or at a Bible camp or lots of places, and they just begin to weep uncontrollably as God begins to heal them from the inside out. I have seen God's power cause somebody, I don't know why he did this, but a person was being prayed for, and the power of God hit them, and they flew across the platform about probably twice this size, and they flew backwards across it, and I went, whoa. <laughs> That's crazy. It was a pastor of all, it was a pastor's conference. <laughs> I've seen multiple people, now this is to me is amazing, multiple people who were timid Christians, who were struggling in their faith, turn into mighty warriors after the Holy Spirit came down and baptized them, changed them, filled them, whatever you want to call it. And they went from, like Peter in the New Testament, who was afraid and denied Jesus three times to standing up preaching. I have seen that over and over and over and over and over again in people in my lifetime. I've seen people at an altar, especially young people, and they're down on their knees or they're standing up and they're raising their hands for an hour or two straight have you ever tried to lift your hands for more than a few seconds? They get tired, don't they? But it was something God did supernaturally in them. I have seen miraculous healings. This is where I want to tell you. I, I think it's a miraculous. But uh, a lot of you have been praying for my brother. My brother was, he got COVID as well. Um, he had problems breathing. They put him into the hospital. And um, I was on vacation at the time, so I, I put him on Facebook, because it was the easiest way for me to get this out, and I asked for prayer, and I know a number of you prayed for him. Um, he went in the hospital. It was a miraculous he got in there. That's a long story. I'll tell you more of it later. He was in the hospital about a week. They, just to get his oxygen where they needed it, they had to put it on full power 
with a face mask on there when he first got in there. It took him about four, three or four hours before he was even himself because he was so oxygen deprived. Within uh, a little bit less than a week, he was out of the hospital. And uh, when he got home, <laughs> I don't know why he does this, but um, God is amazing in how this all worked out. My brother was on the oxygen, and he was slowly weaning himself off of it. He would do less and less. He turned down it. Within about three or four days, he was not using the oxygen during the day. He only needed it at night. Within a week, he had gone back to work, and he's been working now for a week straight. Now, he's still careful. He's still weak. He's got a job where he does a lot of sitting in front of a computer. I was talking to somebody recently, and they said most people who have COVID, when they get on oxygen, they say it's a minimum of four weeks that they bring it home, that they're on it. And he was four days. I'm not saying that to say my brother's anything special, but here's what I believe. When that happens, that's the power of God at work in a situation. Now, why does it work for some people and not others? I don't understand, but I do know this. When we see those things take place, it's a miracle. It changes us. I know there's even people here sitting in this building right now that have had cancer and it's gone into remission as a result of prayer and as a result of even medicine that God uses. God uses medicine to heal, but he also does medicine sometimes with prayer and all kinds of things because you know what? He's not done with you and he's going to take you when it's his time, when it's your time. You see, I could go on forever. We just did testimonies. Here's the thing. When God miraculously shows up, it changes your life. Right? Let me tell you, though, what a power encounter is not. And I believe I need to share this really quickly. First, I want to show you a video of one of my least favorite movies because I used to have nightmares when I was a kid. But there's a, a, an illustration that comes out of this movie, The Wizard of Oz. Let's watch it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Tell me when it's over. This is when they Look first came that. to see Look at that. <laughs> the great wizard of Oz. I want to go home. I am Oz, the great and powerful. Who are you? Who are you? If you please, I am Dorothy, the small and meek. Can I believe my eyes? This is when they came back. Why have you come back? Please, sir, we've done what you told us. We brought you the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. We melted her. Oh, you liquidated her, eh? Very resourceful. Yes, sir. So we'd like you to keep your promise to us, if you please, sir. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. Tomorrow? You've had plenty of time already. Yeah. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures. Think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I uh, don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. How many remember that movie? Here's what I want you to understand about the power of God. It is not counterfeit. 
it is not flash and noise or smoke and mirror. See, to me that represents the enemy, Satan. You know what he does? He roars. He says, I am the great and powerful. And we go, uh. And it's a bunch of flash and noise, but there's not much behind the curtain. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, listen to this, be self-controlled and alert. It says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What it does not say is this, your enemy, the devil, is a roaring lion. It says, he is like a roaring lion. He roars like the Wizard of Oz. But deep down, he's a pussycat, and he only has the power that we allow him to have in our lives. He tries to scare us, to wreak havoc, and do whatever he can to stop us, to intimidate us, to get his way, just like the Wizard of Oz. But he has a lot of smoke and mirrors and flash and noise, especially when it compares to the real thing that God can do, does, and he does all the time. See, power encounters are not with the enemy of our souls. He's just flash and mirrors and smoke. The real thing is what God can do in lives. But you know what he does? He tries to act like he's important. 2 Corinthians 11 says, for such men, it's talking about in the church there, it says, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. There's people out there that pretend like they've got it all, and they're all spiritual, and everything's great. And he says, and no wonder, for Satan himself does what? He masquerades as an angel of light. I've got all the power. I'm good. Listen to me. And it's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. You see, here's what's interesting. Some people will try anything to overcome their addictions, their problems, their weaknesses, but they seek for it in the great and powerful laws or in the counterfeit, the person that cannot help them. Who do you want to have a power encounter with? Do you want the counterfeit or do you want the real thing? An angel masquerading as something good or the author of life itself? You see, God wants us to encounter him in him alone. The world tries to counterfeit it and make it look good. So here's what I believe God wants more for us today. It is time for more. It is time for more. The word for today is more. If we want more power encounters, we need more. More of what, you might ask? Let me tell you what we need more of. We need more of the power of the Holy Spirit. Some people get dogmatic about certain things in the Bible, but they overlook other things. Like, for example, they say where there are prophecies, they will cease. There are tongues, they will be still. There is knowledge, it will pass away. And they say, well, see, tongues pass away. They don't realize that's talking about the end times and when Jesus is gone because knowledge has not passed away. And they get dogmatic about things. But let me tell you some things that you can get dogmatic about when it comes to the power of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not quench the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 14.39 says, Do not forbid speaking in tongues. If that's something that God is doing, then don't forbid it. Or, let me give you another one, Ephesians 5.18. You want a command from God when it comes to more? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. If you want to get dogmatic about more, Take that and say, God, I want to be filled with the Spirit because you tell me to. By the way, did you know that that in the original Greek, be filled with the Spirit, literally is a, it's a present tense. And in Greek, present tense means now and ongoing. If we would translate that properly, we would say, be filled and continue to be filled and continue to be filled and continue to be filled. Be filled with the Spirit of God. We need more of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We need more of the Spirit of God in us. 
There's a song we used to sing. It went like this. More love, more power, more of you in my life. You know what? I think there's something to that. You know what else we need more of? We need more encouragement. We, we quote this about people coming to church or not a lot, but Hebrews 10.25, let me read it right in context. It says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know what we need more of as the God gets closer to the end? We need more encouragement. That's why we meet together, because we cannot be Christians by ourselves. We need more encouragement. I don't know if we can be encouraged too much. I don't know if, you can, I don't know if there's a line that you can be, oh, that, I got too encouraged. <laughs> Just keep encouraging. You know what else we need of more of? Grace and truth together. I mentioned to you a little bit earlier about my friend. His name is Paul. Um, let me read this verse to you, and then I'll explain to you something he's ha- is going on right now. In John 1.14, it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That's talking about Jesus. It says, We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. My friend Paul said the Lord laid this on his heart. He hadn't planned on writing a book, but he just wrote a book called When Jesus Stole My Bread. <laughs> it's a story, it's, it's, a, it's a, a take on the story of when Jesus took the loaves from the child and fed the 5,000. And God gave him this picture to share, and I got a little thing that shows you what this is. If we are all high in grace there, you can be either high in grace, low in grace, or high in truth, or low in truth. We get out of, we get out of where God wants us to be. So here's the things: if you are low in grace and low in truth, that means you don't be- really care about giving people grace, and you don't care about what the truth is. That's what lawlessness is. That's what Herod did in the Bible. Now, if you have lots of grace but no truth. That's like the Sadducees in the Bible. They were like, "Ah, just love everybody. It's okay. But it doesn't matter what you believe, right? That leads to a license to do whatever you want. Now, if you get on the other side over in the top left, where you're high in truth, everything's about truth, but I have no grace. I I just let it out there and let it be. People just have to accept the truth, but no grace. That's called legalism. You have to follow these rules and stand in this. But what does it say Jesus was? He was full of grace and truth. And when you get into that quadrant, that's when you find life. We need we need to be like Jesus with both grace and truth. We need more grace and truth together. How many of you have had ever somebody come up to you and say, Something like, this is the truth and you, got, you just need to believe it. And they said it in such a manner that it was hard to receive. Right? It's hard. Or if you had somebody to say, you just love everybody, it's okay, but you know that they're doing something wrong and they need to be confronted, then you have to have the truth in there. Mark, John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. If there is something that our society needs probably more than just about anything is we need a society that's full of grace and truth combined. Let me give you some other things you need more of. Let me work through these really quickly. We need more Jesus. John the Baptist said in John 3.30, He must increase, I must decrease. How many remember this old song? More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness, see, more of his love who died for me. We need more Jesus. You know what else we need? We talked about this last week, so I won't get into it a lot. We need more workers, that God would send more workers into his harvest field. Here's what else we need. We need more life. How many of you feel like we need more life inside of us, in our world? John 10, 10, here's what Jesus said. I've come that they might have life 
and they ha might have it more abundantly, more life, more. Do you remember that song? Some of you remember that song? Are you trusting Jesus all along the way? Does he grow more precious to your heart each day? We just sang this, didn't we? More abundantly, more abundantly, that they might have life. More abundantly. You see, God wants us to have more life to its full. Here's what else we need, more prayers. Luke 18, Jesus told him a parable about the persistent widow. And you know what the idea was? He wanted us to have more prayer. Here's some prayers I believe God wants for us to pray for. You can write these down if you want. We need more prayers that bring prodigals home. God wants to bring some prodigals home. Let's pray that they will come home. We need more prayers that are a sweet incense to heaven. Did you know the Bible says that when we pray, it's a sweet incense to heaven? We need more prayers that impact the kingdom of darkness negatively, or in other words, they tear down strongholds in the enemy. That's found in 2 Corinthians 10.4. We need more people who pr will pray prayers of faith. What's a prayer of faith? It's standing on God's promises. It's believing what he said. It's believing that God can and will do things. We need more prayers that stir up people for the things of God. In other words, Mark eleven twenty three says we need prayers that move mountains. If you say to that mountain, it will be moved and it shall be done. And lastly, we need power, prayers full of passion and zeal. And we need more passion and zeal. You know what happens sometimes? We get ho-hum in our Christian faith. But Jesus actually tells us in Romans 12, 11, I know I've said this before. Here's an interesting challenge for you. It says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You mean we're not supposed to have like our zeal like wane? Apparently, God's saying you should do your best to never lack in zeal for him. Let me bring us down to where we live today in response. Here's my prayer for us. If we're in a state in our life that we are comfortable, here's my prayer, that God will help us to be unsettled, bored, or uncomfortable inside where you're at if you need to get to where he wants you to be. We need a holy uncomfortableness so that we can get to where God wants us to be. Matter of fact, Doug Clay, I love what he said once. Doug Clay is the, the leader of the Assemblies of God. General superintendent is what his title is. He said this. This is his word for the church recently. Going and doing and being are just as important as coming and seeing. He's saying we need to be people who go, who do, and who are, not just people who say, hey, come to our church and see what God's doing. Let's to where we live what we're supposed to be. So here's the knowledge piece of response. Realize that you have been given more power and authority. You have been given more power and authority. Not just the church, not just the New Testament Christians, not just people down the road. You have been given more power and authority. Listen to Psalm 68, 35. You are awesome, O God, in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Mark 16 says, these signs will accompany those who believe. You know what we would put in there? These signs will accompany those who believe. They sit in nice pews. They have nice clothes. People like them. Right? These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well, now for some of you to pick up a snake with your hands, that would be a miracle. <laughs> I'm not saying go do it, but wow. Jesus sent out his disciples with power in Luke 9, 1 and 10, 19. Here's the action piece. First, know that you have been given more power. You have been given more power and authority. Number two is use the great power and authority you have been given. Not just that you have it, but use it. You know, here's what I think. Too many of us are given power tools and we still try to pound nails and saw boards and build the kingdom of God with our bare hands or our manual tools. 
I'll tell you what. Watching these guys out here when they have the power tools is pretty cool. Zoop. When I did steel siding years ago once, I remember cutting every single one of those pieces with tin snips. And then they have some things that work a lot better. Huh. See, the thing is, we have the power. We don't have to do it by hand. Matter of fact, they said this about Jesus in the New Testament, Mark chapter 1. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of a law. That word authority can also be translated power. And then he passed it on to this. Jesus said, I have given you authority or power to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. See, the early church walked in power. So it is time to step up to the plate and use the power God has given us. You know what we do sometimes as Christians? Sometimes we go into our spiritual battle and it's a gunfight and we're taking a water pistol. We're going pew, 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 pew. And he's pulling his guns out and he's shooting at us. And he's roaring and we're scared. Tell you what, we have the tools. We have the power. We just have to use it. The warning is this, don't limit God's power. Isn't God all-powerful? How many of you today believe God is all-powerful? I do. So how do we limit God's power? Well, when he wants to use you, we don't, you don't let him. You resist him. Matter of fact, Acts 7.51, Jesus told the people of his time, actually this wasn't Jesus, this was Stephen talking about the people who were about to take him out. They were trying to destroy him, they were trying to kill him. He says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. It wasn't that God didn't have the power, it's that they didn't want to use, they didn't want to access that. They didn't want that. That'll mess up my system. What is it that holds you back or limits you from God's power? And then I'll be finished here. Number one, you aren't plugged into the power. If you are not plugged into the power, you will limit God's power. In John chapter 15, it says we need to remain in the vine. Remain in relationship with God. You know, we can know up here, but if we're not actually staying in relationship with him, find ways to plug in with your relationship with God. Here's another thing that limits us. You aren't using it for the right purposes. In James, he says, you kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. The people were praying and doing things because they wanted it for their own sake instead of for God's kingdom. The third one is, this is a big one for us, and then I'm almost done. The reason we limit God's power is sometimes we are scared of it. Remember when I told you the story of the guy who flew across the stage? You know what that did to me? Whoo! God is powerful. And sometimes we see the miraculous and we go, God's powerful. I'm not sure if I can handle that. But 2 Timothy 1.7 said this, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what kind of spirit did he give us? Power, love, and a sound mind. Power comes from God. Fear does not. How many of you think God can be trusted? I do. If he can be trusted, why are we scared of his power? Which spirit are you operating in, fear or power? Which one should you be operating in? I can give you the answer to that one, power. Don't let your fear limit God working in and through your life. And lastly, the reason that some of us limit God's power is we don't ask for it. James 4, 2 says, you have not because you ask not. Have you ever asked God for his power to be at work in your life? Have you ever asked God, help me? Give me your power. I'm going to close with this last thought. As I was praying about this, And what to do to bring this home. I felt like I saw a picture of this. A lot of people are have a ball and chain holding them back from where God wants to take them. 
It's like we're dragging this ball and chain, and we're trying to move forward, but we won't let go of the ball and chain, so we just keep dragging it around. How many of you know that's not a pleasant way to live your life? And I said, God, what are some of the things that are on that ball and chain? And here's some of the things we have to let go of. Number one is weariness. Weariness. I'm just tired. Guess what? He is our strength. Let go of the weariness. You know what else we're carrying around? Tradition. Well, that looks different than I've ever seen it before. That's not how our church did it growing up. That's not how I think it should have been done or or what I've seen. That ball and chain needs to go. Because you know what? I'm going to say something that's a little controversial. If God said have church on a different day of the week, would we be open to it? We should. I'm not saying he has. But we get tradition so stuck in our mind that we carry this ball and chain around. There's a lot of churches that have midweek services, and that's their biggest service they have. Or a Saturday night service. And here's the last thing that hold, the ball and chain that holds people back. Responsibilities. Yeah, but I got this to do. Yeah, but I got that to do. If I, if I open myself up to God, then that might kind of you know, mess up my responsibilities. I might have to let some things go. It's okay. God will take care of it. If I can say, as I said a few weeks ago when I was doing one of my other messages, let me put a song in your head. When it comes to those ball and chains, those weariness, tradition, and responsibilities, let it go, let it go. <laughs> Don't hold back anymore. Let it go. Allow God to flow in you, through you, and that when you do that, I believe God, you will encounter the power of God and it will change you. Here's what I want to do in closing in prayer today. I want to pray that this summer that we would all take opportunities. We would pray for opportunities. We would take advantage of opportunities to encounter the power of God. That we would pray for our teens when they go to camps that they will empower the, uh, encounter the power of God. That the people in our community that need to see God at work in their lives will encounter the power of God and their lives would be changed. Would you pray with that with, with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we agree together that we need more of you. We need more of the power of God in, life, in our lives. We need more so that we can be changed. We need more encouragement. We need more life abundantly. We need more things. But God, there are chains that are holding many people back. And God, if, if there is chains of weariness or tradition or responsibilities or any other chain, Lord, that's holding people back, back Lord, today I pray that in the name of Jesus that they would cut them off, they would release them right now. In the name of Jesus, weariness be gone. In the name of Jesus, tradition be gone. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we release responsibilities and we allow you to work in our lives. God, if there are opportunities that you are placing before us, help us not to walk away from them, but help us to see them and believe them and know that these are things that you're placing in front of us to take us to another level that we would have power encounters with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? One of the things we're going to be doing this fall is we're going to give you more opportunities to pray. I haven't decided what night, maybe Sunday night. I, I believe that we're going to do what's called a school of ministry. And some of you want to use the power that God has placed inside of you to pray for others. And others will come who have needs. I don't even know who that, it can be anybody in the community, whatever. And you're going to apply for it. We don't want just anybody to show up. You have to really have a desire to want to be in a part of that. There's going to be some commitments. I don't know what it's all going to look like, but God's been laying on my heart that we want to have people who come in. You know, somebody out there might come in from outside and say, I don't know what, but I just need prayer over this situation. And the power of God, as you're praying for them, will give you a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, or will tell you about something, and God will do something in their life, and their life will completely be changed, the trajectory. Why? Because they encountered God and we were willing. Pray about it. Maybe God wants to use you to do ministry to others around the community. I don't know what it's all going to look like, but God's putting some pieces together. 
How many are excited for what God's going to do? I am. So God, help us to be open in the next few weeks, days, even, even today, for what you have planned. Prepare our hearts for the good things you have. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.